So are you guys ready for the last talk of today? We're going to begin in 30 seconds. So the last talk of today is going to be about uh, Nick Space development environments at Shopify by Berkey Libby. Okay. Give him a hand. Does this work? <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm aware that I'm standing between many of you and beer, so I'll try to keep this somewhat short and somewhat entertaining. Uh, I work at Shopify. where. Uh, e-commerce company, software as a service company. We have about 6,000 employees and maybe one to 2,000 of those are developers. So that's, uh, I work on developer tools there. So that's a bit about this. So um, what the company does isn't too important, but what we run on is for context. So our developers use MacBook Pros. We have like something like 1,000 of them. Um, our CI is based on Docker and BuildKite, and our production is mostly Kubernetes and Google Cloud. So what that means is like we're really straddling this world of Darwin and uh, Linux. Development happens entirely on Darwin, basically, and then production is all Linux. Uh, that works in large part because most of our code is in Ruby, JavaScript, things like this, uh, interpreted languages. Um, Ruby is very dominant, especially in our older, more central code bases. Um, relatively few of our projects have any sort of compilation step. They all basically run from the source, except for, you know, we, like any company, have a bunch of stuff in various languages, and some have compile steps, but the, the really critical core applications that hundreds or thousands of people work on are basically interpreted, meaning that we have no build phase in development. So that kind of informs the tools we build because we don't care so much about build systems. Um, but we do have the problem everyone has where you end up with, as you grow over time and have more projects, they all have their own readme with like setup instructions. And then you're going through this readme and, um, you know, trying not to get annoyed at having to install, you know, some particular version of MySQL. So, like, I'm getting to Nix eventually, just I'm trying to give you context on, on uh, what, what I'm adapting this into. So uh, dev is this tool that, that manages all of that kind of stuff. It kind of has, I like to think of it as three groups of commands. On the left, you have, like, locating code bases. The middle is um, a command that sets up all of the dependencies to run that project. And on the right, there's a few kind of standardized keywords that we encourage people to implement. So um, the first group, see if my screencast works, yes. So you can clone a project. We use the short name and it kind of locates it on GitHub, it clones it, automatically changes into that directory. And then we have uh, another dev CD command that fuzzy matches based on all the projects that exist on the system. Um, nothing really super exciting there, but it's using a shell hook, um, which lets us change the directory. DevUp is the real meat of it. Um, so I created a, a toy app here. Um, just ignore what's happening on the left side of the screen for a second, but basically dev is configured with this dev.yaml file, um, which is kind of the, the minimum possible configuration that we could use to specify what actually needs to happen to, to run this application. And keep in mind, like, this is setting up everything on Mac OS to run software and the thing about developers mac os machines is they're all broken in a million weird ways that you don't expect because developers do strange things to their machines right so this all has to work on a thousand machines and the amount of 
bullshit that we have to do to make that all happen is truly astounding. <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, basically what we're saying is um, up is a list of, we call them tasks. In this case, we've got a Ruby task specifying a particular version and a bundler task. Uh, the gem file is what bundler uses to specify its dependencies. We just list one, it's called CLI UI, which is a really trivial, or small at least, gem that we maintain. And then over on the left, it goes through some stuff and runs them. So number one is some global stuff that happens in every project, and then we did the tasks that we listed. So kind of critical to this paradigm is uh, met and meet is the API that we use to implement all of these tasks. It's like if met fails, it runs it, otherwise it skips right away. Um, let me rephrase that. <laughs> it runs met, if it's false, it runs meet, and then asserts that met must be true. So when you see gold stars here, it was like it already ran uh, true and didn't decide to, to run the actual satisfier. It did run the satisfier for bundle install. And then test, server, console, build, these are just like, it's basically just a mapping to like some command to run. So this, this is super lightweight, but it gives us a huge amount of consistency across our thousands of projects because we just sort of mandate that developers should put something in whatever of those fields are useful. The main thing with dev is like one command to a runnable project. Um, and of course, this is something that Nix can do too, and so you're probably starting to see where I'm going with this. Um, the reality is that our configurations look a lot like this, where we have like homebrew and then, I don't know, a million packages. And like actually just about all of those are only used for building Ruby gems with native extensions, right? So that feels kind of not great, especially because then when you have, you know, hundreds of projects that all have the same gems with native extensions, you're all redundantly specifying the same homebrew packages. And then when like one of those homebrew packages updates, you don't have any ability to like manage that, that version update. So you like end up in this state where a thousand developers have a thousand different versions of like libgda or something and the gem just, you, you just have a bad week. So there's two things basically that we do in DevUp. We provision files onto the machine and we start some processes, right? This is basically what a software dependency is, is one of these things. Like you, you either have a file someplace or you have some typically socket listening on something. So Nix is great at provision file, provisioning files. I learned today that it's actually kind of capable of starting processes on Darwin, but I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> so yeah, like, Let's use Nix. It sounds great for, for um, repeatability and, and just my team's sanity to, to like forklift all of dev up onto Nix. And so I've been working on that for a while. Uh, the rest of this talk is kind of like an explanation of the problems I ran into and the solutions I, I like kind of came up with before eventually realizing that in most of those cases, those are already solved problems and I just hadn't found the solutions. So, um, like, <laughs> there, there is some neat, neat new stuff at the end, but I, I actually, like, learned about some things today where I'm like, wow, I can throw away so much code. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the boring one first. Uh, I know you don't, like, you're not thrilled about the prospect of me talking about authentication, but uh, we're at a, c at a company where we unfortunately have to care. So. We, this is kind of tangential, but like just quickly, we use an overlay to distribute a bunch of our private stuff. Dev is distributed literally as a bag of files at slash opt slash dev. And so we just put an overlay in that repo that distributes with the same mechanism and we link it from the like nix packages dot config thing. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so the, the main problem we've had with this is like, you can use HTTP basic auth with like the, the netrc thing that Nix does, but we kind of like would really like to use OAuth 2 to Google Cloud for a lot of things, and man, that's just painful. So uh, one thing that we want to do is like, we have a private overlay, so of course we want a private binary cache so that you don't have every developer building everything from that overlay. So Cachex is an option for that, um, but the 
authentication model didn't work super cleanly for us. Um, and this was an experiment at the time, and it's just insanity to try to get our finance department to fund an experiment. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. I didn't feel like dealing with it. So <laughs> um, the thing is, our users already have like Google Cloud credentials on their machines, so we wanted to just use that because we could just use a GCS bucket. Um, so we kind of figured that out. Um, we already had a, an Nginx machine on users, or sorry, an Nginx process on users' machines, and we just kind of like did some crazy shit with Lua to inject the auth. <laughs> so like, yeah. <laughs> so that sort of works. Um, uh, all the code that I reference here is posted there. It's like linked again at the, the end. Um, but yeah, so we wrote like a gcloud.lua that just rips the credentials out of the user's home directory, injects them into the request, and like forwards it on and pretends it came from something that wasn't GCS. Uh, but that doesn't answer like how do we fill the cache, right? You want to you wanna actually upload build results. So we, uh, it turns out there's this thing that just pretends to be S3 and actually uploads to GCS. And <laughs> Nick's copy is capable of uploading to S3. <laughs> so we have this post build hook that we configure. Uh, I think there was a talk about this. I missed it. But yeah, post build hooks are cool. We essentially just, when uh, we finish a build, we mark it in like a spool directory. And then we have a background daemon that comes and picks that up and uploads it. But uploading it means basically we run Nick's copy to this endpoint thing which is in our Nginx, which then decides whether it wants to like pretend it uploaded it because it suspects it already exists on cache.nexos.org, or upload it to a local instance of Minio running on the developer's machine, which then injects the credentials to upload it to GCS. So that was fun. Uh, um, is there a better way to do this? Probably. <laughs> I, d I couldn't figure it out at the time. So. Uh, the other authentication thing that I've had a lot of trouble with is like authenticated gems. So this is probably a problem regardless of the language runtime, but like we have gems that are private. They're specified via like um, a pre-shared token to a, a private repository via the user's like some personal access token they have stored in Mac OS Keychain for GitHub HTTPS or maybe via like GitHub SSH. So that's three different mechanisms that are all kind of not like really easy to get working. And then you take like the cross product of that with having to support getting that working in like actual Nix land and then also in prefetch land because if you're using like Bundix or probably any of the, the like equivalents for other language runtimes, you have a whole different phase that has different code and like it's not the same. And then you kind of take the cross product of that with like there's different types of credentials on different types of machines, right? If we're using like Google Cloud, we'll have one kind of like actual real user credential on a developer machine, but then a service account on a CI machine. So like, I don't know, man. It's, <laughs> we're, we're getting there, but this is like way more painful than I thought it was gonna be. Um, user interface is another thing. So this is something where I learned things today, but so uh, I'll explain what I learned in a minute, but this is uh, running dev up in a thing that's using Nix, and it's quite pretty, I think. Uh, it's got a spinner, and it's spinning, and it's downloading stuff. Right now it's downloading Ruby on a not super fast connection. There we go, gems, great, and we're good. So there, cool. Um, uh, for that, I ran like nix dash build or something with dash vvvq, and that generates a lot of output. And I wrote a really fun state machine for that. Uh, I discovered today that nix space build has much better output than nix dash build. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to look different next week. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the overall workflow is, is something where I think we, we, we've actually figured out some, some cool stuff. And it, it might actually be similar to Lori, which I haven't heard of until today either, because I live under a rock or something. So 
the the two main ways that you can like that are the two main obvious ways that you could like interact with a set of Nix packages for a, a project type deal. You have like you could put them into a Nix profile and use like Nixenv to manage it, or you could use Nix shell. Um, I wanted to kind of maintain the same workflow we've always had with dev, s which is like the user CDs into a directory. And I guess I didn't explain this, but part of the motivation of dev being a shell hook is that we activate a lot of environment for people when they change into a project directory. This has been really like um, case by case specific and hard coded for a long time, but with Nix, we necessarily have to make it a little more generic because we don't know ahead of time all of the things the user might specify as a, a Nix uh, dependency. So, uh, backtracking to the current slide, um, Nix shell is not happy for us because we don't want to make our users run a subshell. We want them to just change into the directory. So, on that metric, Nixenv is the apparently correct solution. Um, or like we could do some crazy hacks with Nix shell to export that environment and do other things with it. And I went down that road and it worked okay. But the problem with that road was that like, so Nixenv sets path and man path. Like when you activate a Nix profile, you get path and man path, which if you only care about binaries, that's great. Um, but when you run Nix shell, a cool thing happens, which is that you get a load of extra environments. And sometimes you want that environment, like gem path, for example, is set. I'm talking a lot about Ruby. It's because I write a lot of Ruby. And I'm, a I'm sorry, it's a horrible language. You can deal with this for now. Um, it's not horrible. It's slightly horrible. Anyway, um, so you get some of these extra variables in Nix shell. The problem is like when you run Nix shell, you also get CC and LD, and like that means you get the the patched or wrapped version of the compiler and linker that completely reject to do anything outside of the Nix store. And because we're in this situation where our projects don't actually have build phases, we're kind of straddling this boundary where like maybe people want to build something that's not in the Nix store because we're half in this world. We don't want all those variables. Really, um, Nixenv does not give you any of that environment. I'm sorry for anyone that's colorblind. I should have thought harder about this. These are all red. These are all green. Um, Nix shell activates all of that environment, but we don't want all of it. What we actually want is just the top level, which is the first order dependencies of the, the actual profile that we build. Um, and maybe this exists and I just don't know about it, but I couldn't find anything that kind of does this automatically. So um, we built this tool called Shadow Env, um, partially motivated by this. Um, it takes this, here's an example of, so <laughs> it's Lisp because I wanted to assign some environment variables, and um, I wanted conditionals, and this is the simplest thing I could figure out. So it takes that and turns it into this behavior. This is basically the same thing as Duranv, um, but uh, I didn't know about Duranv when I started building it. <laughs> um, and then I kept it because it, uh, because like it only gives you access to the, the existing process environment when it starts and nothing else. And it's actually a pretty smart like bytecode interpreter and stuff too. So it, it typically completes in like tens of milliseconds, if that. And it's hard capped at 100 milliseconds. So um, when I would play with Duranv, like it doesn't seem quite reasonable to run it as a shell hook all the time or like every time you open a file in an editor, you have to like care about asynchronicity and things like this where uh, Shadow Env is just, it's just essentially instantaneous. So I run it um, on every shell hook and like opening files in an editor. So Shadow Lisp is uh, a compilation target. Um, but then like, so Shadow Lisp is decidedly not bash. So how do we generate um, that for our dependencies? Well, um, so if this is the expression that our project uses, you can see there's like MySQL, Node.js, some gem thing, Ruby, shell check, Z shell. We uh, take the references of that profile, which is like, okay, it's a list of next door paths. Um, the way shell, like those environment settings actually work when you load a Nix shell is you have these files. There's a special file within a Nix uh, derivation output path or whatever that would be called. 
nix support slash setup hook that contains a fragment of, I guess, bash, some sort of shell thing. And uh, this is meant to be run with standard env slash generic slash setup dot sh loaded. Uh, that defines a bunch of functions that kind of exist in the default builder. And so this is all run. Um, these are literally just sourced into a Nix shell as you load them. But uh, there's not that many functions. So we just kind of made a translator um, by, it's actually a bash script that just implements those functions, but prints those things to standard out, and it works pretty well. Um, so then on dev up, we like install all the Nix stuff, tag it as a GC root, compile the shadow env, and then uh, write it out so that it gets loaded automatically. So then to just, this is actually the same as before, but I'm gonna draw your attention to the part at the end after it finishes downloading Ruby. <laughs> yep, that's a spinner. Okay, so as soon as this is done, it says generate shadow env and then activated shadow env. So then it's active. And if you like change directory out and back in, it works. If you run, if you open VS code or something um, and have the plugin installed, it is just sort of transparently the right environment. Um, so very similar to durenv, but faster. Um, uh, so this is kind of like, uh, in an in the real world example of what that looks like, the the top chunk is just kind of our activation of our sort of fake profile. We set dev profile to the path. There's some uh, weird crap about Ruby because Ruby is a weird language to activate because it depends on I don't know a dozen variables. Uh, stuff translated from the setup hooks and then more specific Ruby stuff because cool. So yeah, the next things I'm gonna work on are like actually getting gems authenticating properly. But then um, the thing after that is like dev up, dev does a few things. Uh, dependencies are the major one, but it also like allows you to specify those test console server build whatever commands. Um, what I really wanna do is like have it in a situation where you can say something like, this is a Ruby project and have that generate like a Nix configuration fragment, but also generate some widgets for understanding like kind of what sort of test setup are you gonna use and like what does it mean to run that? And maybe you have like a Ruby and a Node.js component and it kind of intelligently gets how to run tests for both or make you select. And so I'm trying to figure out how much of that to put in like Nix land and how much of that to do as a sort of YAML-like wrapper around it. I don't know. That's that's what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, like um, all this to say, <laughs> when I started this project, I knew just enough Nix to know that it was probably the right thing to do, and now I barely know any more. But um, <laughs> so. <laughs> If anybody knows a lot and wants to come help me, that's cool. But <laughs> questions? So you use the tool dev up and dev test. Uh, what do, why don't you use uh, make with make file? Um, so that is actually, <laughs> I did. I was using make like very early on. The reason is like, make is definitely a reasonable way to specify like server console build test, uh, those things. But for dev up, uh, it does a substantially more complex thing. Like it's probably possible to do that with make, but it would end up, I think, with more configuration in the individual projects than I would have wanted. And you'd have a lot of like transient, like um, Sentinel files that, uh, it'd be possible, but this felt cleaner. Uh, one more question. So, uh, how often do you update your packages and Ruby itself? 
because it seems that you have a lot of things hard coded, like Ruby version and all that. Yeah, I want to get away from that. Um, right now we have the the like x dot y dot z Ruby version hard coded, and I think that's a really bad thing that we should stop doing. So I like that Nix conveniently does what I think we should be doing, which is just depending on the minor version. Um, how often do we update it? So it depends on the project, right? Because we have that hard-coded, like our, our really core projects will run the most recent release, but then other projects can languish for years without getting an update, which is bad. And switching to Nix would help that a bit. So I didn't quite quite catch why why are those environment variables you get from Nick Shell a problem for you? Um, the, why C, the CC and and so on, all of these transitive dependencies that said. Yeah. What uh, issues did you have? So, I'm trying to remember specifically. So first off, there's like there's just a load of them, right? Like you get all sorts of kind of like Nick's internal looking things, a whole bunch of things from the the derivation that just aren't like their environment variables in the builder just because that's how the builder works, but it doesn't really make sense to export them to a user's shell if you really think about it. Because, sorry, from the perspective of, um, I'm just gonna, just, I'm aborting that sentence. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the real thing is like, um, because we don't have build steps in most of our projects, you'll get the occasional case where somebody decides that this project does have a build phase and we don't manage that in Nix land, right? So then when you try to compile something in your local project directory, that's not in the Nix store. Um, and then like CC and LD are not useful